doesn't look real. It doesn't look real, huh? That's but that's a real hundred dollars. It's the real deal. They made a new one. <laughs> it's the new hundred dollar bill. And I have a piece of Talmud that I'm going to share with you guys today. And if someone explains it to me, if someone explains the piece of Talmud okay. satisfactorily to me, I'll be another give them the hundred dollars. Right. Yeah? Deal. Deal? Who's excited? Huh? Who's excited? They're yeah. all excited. Now, I want to just make as a, as a mention that I was thinking about this piece of Talmud for a few months. And I didn't have shot in it until recently. Kama Chodashim, let's be cheaper a little bit. A few months I was thinking about this particular piece of Talmud. That means we have not a chance of getting nah, it. Nah, not. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from the Talmud in the very first book of Talmud. The Talmud is called Brachos. Brachot. Yeah. Brachot. 57b. Nun Zain Amud Bet. I'm going to read to you where I wrote down word for word. 57b. 57b. Talmud says like this. I'm read every word, I'll say it in Hebrew or in Aramaic. Over? No, I wrote a word for you. You can okay. trust me. It's a real, um, you know, this is word for I copied it today. Shlosha me'ain olam haba. Three things. Three things are me'ain olam haba, are like, are similar, are a measure. I think the best word for me'ain is similar. Is well, very good. How do you know that? You know Talmud. Been around, been been around, around the block a few time. times, huh? Um, Eluhain. These are these three things which are similar, which are a measure of the uh, the world to come. Shabbat, Shabbos, Shemesh. Shem, what does Shemesh mean? Oil. Sun. Sun. Oil. That's Shemen. Shemen, very good. Tashmish. What does Tashmish mean? Tashmish. No. So, um, so the Talmud has asked the same question. What does Tashmish mean? Tashmish. 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 So, uh, uh-huh. uh, okay. Okay. So I thought it's abbreviation for Tachad 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 all right. Okay. So let's 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 do this again. Let's do this again slowly. Three things are like the world to come. Olam haba. These are the three things. Number one, Shabbos. We all know what Shabbos is. Shabbat, Shemesh, the sun, and Tashmish. The, the Talmud asks, what does Tashmish mean? Okay. Ilema Tashmish Hamita, which means sexual intercourse. Hai Tachish. It makes someone weak. Ella Tashmish Nekavan. Rather, it means using the restroom, removing one's bowels. That's the end of the piece of Talmud. And if someone explains this piece of Talmud to me, I give them $100. Let me make it on $120. Not $100 is enough. Three things are the world to come. Three things in this world are similar to the world to come Shabbat, Shabbat sun. the sun, and Tashmish. What does Tashmish mean? It doesn't mean Tashmish Amita. Sexual intercourse made someone weak. Tashmish to cover, removing one's bowels. That's me'en olam haba. If someone could, I literally, might. anyone has any ideas? I guess what is what I would guess. My first impression would be that olam haba is supposed to. Yeah, we are kind of like godly in olam haba. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it is saying that sexual intercourse, although pleasurable it is not like Ulam Abad because it exhausts you okay that's what it seems to be saying that's what it said on the surface so but relieving yourself after you know if you really had to go to the bathroom so badly that moment when you actually get a chance to go it is it is like a relief the relief the the relief after being having been under the distress of not being able to go so let me ask you a question what, what, what are you going to say well I'm saying there's, there's, a, there's, there's lots of issues here to analyze first of all what does it mean what does that mean second of all what does Shabbos have we're we're familiar with it because it's part of the song it's part of the song so we're familiar we say it in every Shabbat Menucha and 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 the 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 
second soul that you get, you get extra extra, extra soul. Well, what does extra, extra soul mean? Extra energy, extra mm-hmm. extra vitality. Extra vitality, vibrancy. <laughs> and then the sun gives us vitamin D. Yeah, but if you are close enough to sun, you're gonna be. Psh. I learned once that uh, for every aspect that is in Alam Haba, Hashem gives you um, a physical uh, sample of it in this in this world. And for us to understand what is the spiritual being of in being in Alam Haba, Shabbat is one aspect of Alam Haba, but in this world. Okay. So when you go to the bathroom, you lose part of your being that it was part of you, but it wasn't really you. You lost, and then you feel so good. And the same thing when you go to Alam Haba, your whole being is your essence, your spiritual aspect. When you lose your physical body, when you die, you feel so good about that you just not physical anymore, you are all spiritual. So maybe because you lose part of you that it wasn't really you, it wasn't really you, it was just what represented you in a in a not real way, then that is similar to going to the back. So wait a minute. So but uh, I think that I like the idea, um, but I don't think it's actually factual. Let me tell you why. When do you lose your body? When you die, when you, die. Yeah. What, you don't. What is When's Olam Haba? There's you no. Get it back. Huh? You get yeah, it it back. seems like you can get it back later. So you lose it again. It means Olam is not about losing the body per se. Separating the, the neshama. Well, you have just a neshama. That's that's a very important point. Right. You have just a neshama. But I can't. It seems a little. I like the idea. I love the idea actually. But it, it seems like that's what we're comparing to Olam Haba. Really. The fact that what you lost, not what you are. You lost what wasn't really you. It wasn't you. Because we live in a physical world, we have to deal with physical things. And one of us So you're saying you're saying like there's there's like okay, we have a body and a soul. Yes. And the body's like the waste. No. You know, it's we kinda Okay, I get that. So Olama Ba, you don't have that. Fine, but, but this is this is main Olama Ba because it's somewhat similar. I guess I like it. But not I mean, bad. It's, it's but we you know we've talked about it in here. It's the Makloka is between uh, 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 you know Ram Paul and the Ramban on one side, I think, and, and Ramban on the other side. That like that they say that you do have your body in in Olam Haba, right? That that's part of it because you use your body. To do mitzvahs, then your body also gets a part of that reward. So you get, you know, a perfected body, a per- body, you know, without all the schmutz, but still a body, a physical. There's a there's a physical e- existence, so to speak. Or your, physi- physical, or your physical, your physical body becomes spiritual. Right, but yeah, that physical body doesn't need physical thing anymore. It doesn't need to breathe or eat or go to the bathroom or take a shower or all of these physical things. That is just a figure of. It has, neshama, form, it has a form. It has a form. Form of your maybe. neshama, which I guess is mm-hmm. it should be see through like what was Adam Harishon in the beginning before the chet. Is, does this have to go back to the expression that we have th- what we learned that the Torah is given on this earth that our f- even though our heads are in shamayim, we are, our feet are supposed to be on the ground. Does it have something to do with the? duality of our existence in terms of spirituality and physicality that 
on this world in means this that world, the Torah, the Torah is going to the Torah is very physical. The Torah talks about animals who right. gore each other. That's a very physical thing, but that's like a physical interface to a spiritual existence. I think I'm actually going to mention that a little bit later. I have written something written down like that uh, with regards to one of these three things. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so I want to start off here. I like it. I think it's very, very good ideas that I got. I'm still not quite satisfied. No one yet earned, earned, their, earned their cash. Maybe, maybe. I know it. I don't think I got people <laughs> talking about the sun and all. Or the sun, exactly. It's, it's bizarre. It's very bizarre, um, at least on the surface. And when I did some digging, I found that there's a lot of very interesting examples. Like you said, you said that there is... Uh, that's what it means. Me'enel Baba means it's a physical entity which is somewhat similar to the spiritual entity. That, that's obviously what it means. But how exactly these three things are similar is, is, is what I want to dig into a little bit today. So I want to start off with, uh, with the Rambam. So you mentioned the Rambam here. There's a very wonderful uh, discourse, essay, treatise that the Rambam gives on Olam Haba. And he writes that uh, we're all familiar with the uh, 13 principles of faith. Who, who came up with the 13 principles of faith? Rambam. Where did he write them? Where? Yigdal. Well, Yigdal is an adaptation of it. Where did the Rambam write? Anyone knows? Everyone knows the Rambam wrote these 13 principles of faith. What is the question? When did he Where? 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 Did he write it in the... In, while he was in the Middle East or in... in no, Rambam? where? Where is it written? Is it, is, is it a letter? Is it... Is it Yad HaChazaka? I don't... I'm just... It's not a Yad HaChazaka, and it's not a Mor Nevuchim. It's not a Mor Nevuchim. So where is it? Where? Is it? Where did the Rambam um, write this? Everyone knows these 13 principles and that the Rambam wrote them. No, it's not a Yad HaChazaka. It's not in a Mishnah Torah Yad HaChazaka. It's not there. That's what I would think. You would say, listen, Deot or Yisodea Torah, right? These are the principles of the Torah. These are the 13 things you have to believe if you want to be Jewish. It doesn't write it there. The way he writes it is in Pirush HaMishnayas. The very first thing that the Rambam wrote uh, was an enormous commentary in all of Mishnah. He actually wrote it in Arabic. And uh, it's in the entire Mishnah, all 63 books of the Mishnah, we have the Pirush HaMishnayas, which, uh, commentary of the Mishnah of, of the Rambam. So we translated it, it was translated. And in the very last chapter of the Mishnah, of, this, of the Masechet Sanhedrin, the Rambam starts off, because the last chapter talks about Olam Abba, that's where the, 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 all the Talmud pieces of Olam Abba are in that chapter. He starts off with an amazing introduction, very, very long, like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of words, where he talks all about Olam Abba, and then afterwards he brings the 13 principles of faith, to the 13 Yisodot. But in there, he writes for a lot of interesting things about Lama Ba, and he gives descriptions, and he do not get too bogged down. Maybe if we have more time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about what, what he says. But he says they're very interesting. He says, if you want to explain to a human what Lama Ba is, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? Right? You can't do it. Right? You know why you can't do it? It's like trying to explain color to a blind person. How do you explain color to a blind person? You say, oh, red is very bright or flashy or and green is luscious what are you talking about unless you've experienced it unless you've been there unless you've seen color only then should you understand it try for a second to imagine like how would you describe what would you use what terms would you use to describe color to a blind person or describe sound to a deaf person there's no way to do it there's no way for us to understand Alam Haba why is that because Alam Haba is a place we were souls. Now, whether or not we have a body or not, I don't want to get into that debate. Um, but the, what does the Talmud say? The Talmud says, Olam haba, en bo lo achila velo shtia. There's no eating, there's no drinking. Ela tzadikim yoshvim vatrosem beroshem. Or just tzadikim sitting and their crowns are on their head. But clearly, if there is a physical uh, element, it's not the same physical element that we're familiar with. The Ramam calls it Olam HaNeshamot. It's a world of Neshamot. So this kind of existence is something that's very, very beyond our capacity to understand. Right? We're blind people. We have never been there. Right? We've never seen color. Yeah, there's no way for us to describe it to us. That being said, we have from 
the Rambam, from this Talmud, we have descriptions of certain qualities and certain qualifications, certain elements, aspects of Olam Abba. There are three things in this world that are main, that are similar in some way to Olam Abba. Shabbos, Shemesh, Tashmesh. Right? And I think that we could analyze these three things and we'll find little insights about uh, or correlations between Shabbos, Shemesh, and Tashmish that are, are, are what uh, the, 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 you know, our sages and primarily the Rambam and the Talmud describe as Allah Mabba. So let's start with number one, Shabbos. I think Shabbos is the easiest one. It gets harder as you move along. So what do we know about Shabbos? You, you, you do the preparation for it for the six days of the week leading up, and then you enjoy the fruits thereof on Shabbos. Booyah. We have, what do we have? We have a Talmud. The Talmud says that Hayom la'asosa umachar l'kabel schar. Today is the time where we do the mitzvot. Do we get reward for a mitzvot in this world? Schar, yeah. I'm quoting a lot of Talmud here, so I'm going to try to, try to translate everything. Schar mitzvah b'hai alma leka, which means in Aramaic, the reward for mitzvah in this world we don't have. Right? And the Talmud also compares it to Shabbat. If someone prepares for, for Shabbat, they have food on Shabbat. Why? Right? Shabbat can't prepare. It's a time of consumption. Before Shabbat is preparation, right? this world is preparation for next world, where it's consumption. Right? It's a very, very nice uh, corollary between... I mean, sh- Shabbat is the same thing. You're frantically trying to get everything done before Shabbat. Shabbat comes, you've got to stop. Overwork. Whatever you did, you accomplished... Whatever you didn't do, you didn't. if you forgot to turn the cholent on, the chamin on, you're toast. <laughs> you don't have the chamin. Right? If you didn't, you didn't put the drinks in the fridge, well, yet you might be able to put it in the fridge. But you, you didn't cook food, you don't have to eat. Alam whoever works hard in this world, who does a lot of mitzvot, you have food to eat. You have food to eat. In fact, we're, we're told there's a pasuk that says, Ki lo alechem levad adam. Right? Which means a man doesn't need, needs much more than just bread. He needs much more than just bread. He needs also Torah. The idea being is that we have a soul and a body. Our body has needs. Our body has an agenda. Our soul also has needs, and our soul also has an agenda. Our body needs food. Our soul also needs food. What food does our body need? We know it's bread. But the Torah tells us, Lo ala lechem levad adam. Right? It's not just bread. You need much more than that. You need also Torah. Why, why do you need Torah? Wait a minute. I could be alive very well without Torah. The people, they're, they're, you're Jews, they never learned the Torah, and they're very healthy. Physically, not spiritually. Exactly. Your soul also needs bread. Very similar. There's a very clear uh, parallel. Right? And if you don't prepare it beforehand, right? you don't prepare your bread beforehand, well, your soul's going to starve. Similar to Shabbat. Very, very nice. I think that's a. I, I told someone recently when I was uh, telling this over, I think that that's the simple understanding of, 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 of Shabbos. Um. Everyone agrees? Everyone disagrees? Yes. Everyone's with me? Everyone? Anyone uh, still hopes on getting the hundred dollars? <laughs> no, but I want to say another shot. I want to say this is a more of a, a deeper insight. I want to say like this. For us in this world, doing mitzvot is unnatural. What I mean by this is as follows. For us, we say the soul has an agenda, the body has an agenda. For us, what do we feel most associated with? The physical. The physical, right? I, I hate you, I give you a zet, your body feels it. If I hate your soul, your soul doesn't feel it. Well, maybe it does on a certain level, an intellectual level, an emotional level, maybe. But your soul, you, you know, if someone doesn't have food for a day, he starts feeling it. If you don't have drink, your water for a day, you feel it even more. If your soul could go three days, three weeks without studying Torah, you don't feel it at all. We don't have a sensory uh, association with our, with our neshama, right? Now, olam haba, it's all flipped. What happens olam haba? You have a soul, and all you feel is the soul. So you, if someone hits your soul, you feel it hurts. You want to go to the soul hospital, which is what we call it. By the way, see, there's a such thing as a soul hospital. It's called the yeshiva. That's what it is, by the way. The chazonish, by the way, described yeshivas as, as hospitals. Because your soul got damaged, it got, it got repaired. It's just an emergency room. That's an emergency room for souls. And you have to bring people in an ambulance. It's quickly into the yeshiva, you know. Quickly, let's operate him. Let's pump him with some Torah. <laughs> right? But in, in Olam Abba, everything is going to be upside down. Why? Because your, your body, if you have a body, it's not, you don't feel it at all. 
So it's immaterial. Like it's not. You can go three days without eating. You don't even feel it. Your soul is everything. Is all that you feel. Now in this world, we can't really connect that. It's it's it, we're the blind person. You can't describe that to us. Can you imagine a time where? Can you imagine a life where two days without Torah and you you die? You, you can't imagine that because for us in this world, our connection, our natural state is one of a body state. And therefore, doing mitzvahs is unnatural for us. It's awkward. It's awkward to, uh, for us to engage in spiritual exercise because we don't feel like there's some sort of material benefit. Our bodies don't feel like they make sense. That's why we have so many challenges. Why is it a big deal to do a mitzvah? Why is it so hard sometimes? How can we have such resistance? If it's the Almighty, the Almighty God, Creator of Heaven, who tells you to do a mitzvah, you say, I don't know, I don't feel like it, I don't know why, I don't, I, I'd rather not, I'd rather sleep in, I don't want to go to Shachrit. Right? How could you possibly say that? The answer is, for us, it's difficult. It's unnatural. It's unnatural because our bodies is the one who is in the driver's seat and our soul is in the trunk, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, the uh, first scene in the movie, uh, Goodfellas. Our soul's in the trunk, right? That's, th- that, that, that's where our soul is, and the, dri- the body is in the driver's seat. The mitzvahs of Shabbos. The mitzvah of Shabbos is a little bit like Olam Abba. It's me'en Olam Abba. Why is that? Well, what are we told in Shabbat? Someone mentioned in Shabbat, Nishan, 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 Who mentioned that? It was you? Well, what does the Shema Yitera mean? So if you look at the Talmud that's discussed in Shema Yitera, it's in, it's in Beitza, I think it's in 16a. It says that on Shabbos we're given the capacity to eat and to drink as much as we possibly can. We don't even feel sick about it. The idea being is that Shabbos, the mitzvahs of Shabbos, are physical ones as well as spiritual ones. We're told on Shabbos, make a feast, eat. Well, our bodies can get on board with that. It's very natural for our bodies to want to do that kind of mitzvah. It makes perfect sense. Huh? Let's have a feast. That's part. Let's, you're supposed to sleep on Shabbat. You're supposed to have ta'anud on Shabbat. You're supposed to have pleasure on Shabbat. What kind of pleasure? Physical pleasure as well. The idea being is that Shabbat is the one time that we can feel what it's like to do a mitzvah and to be totally on board with it. To not have any resistance, to be totally natural. Because Shabbat, like you mentioned, Shabbat is an interface between the physical and the spiritual. It's a time where we could do a physical thing that our bodies are so excited about. It's totally natural for us. We're not going against, so to speak, our basic constitution. We're not rebelling against our body. And our soul is delighted as well. And Alam Abba, you know what it's going to be like? You're going to do a mitzvah. You're going to engage in spiritual activities, and that's going to be feel totally natural, as 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 natural as wolfing down some delicious challah on Friday night feels like. In Olam Abba, you get to do. Mitzvah? Well, you get. So I, I, if you I, if you notice, I amended. I said engage in spiritual activities. You can obviously do a mitzvah the same way. Mitzvah means in this world, but the idea being you could do a spiritual activity, and that's natural, very natural. Why? Because that's your, your, all you have is a neshama. So I, I think that, that this is legitimate as well. I think that... Um, the is, what do you mean by this? Spiritual activity. Oh. That's what it says. That's a spiritual activity. Uh, that's going to feel totally natural. So um, I think that if in the first explanation of this uh, piece of Talmud, we have really two explanations, uh, which I think are legitimate. There might be more as well. Uh, the number one idea of Shabbos is very similar to Lama Ba because you got to prepare beforehand, and then there's a deadline. That deadline is, you know, whatever that, whenever the period is, or when Shabbos is, and then you can't prepare, prepare anymore. So Lama Ze, you have to work. Lama Ba, you you consume. Friday, uh, you work, and Shabbos, you consume. That's the simple understanding. I think another understanding is that Shabbos is a time where we could do a mitzvah. And we could do a spiritual thing, and it feels totally natural. Right? There's no resistance. Shabbos, the mitzvahs of Shabbos are physical and spiritual as well. Okay, that's one. That's one. What about Shemesh? What about Shem? What is sun? What is the sun? What is the star of our solar system? What does it have to do with a Lama Ba? Come on. Is it so much fun to sit in the sun? We're told there's been such wonderful pleasure, Lama Ba. Lama Ba is a place of pleasure. It's a place of consumption reward. What does it have to do with the sun? Come on. The sun. The sun can burn you, no? The energy of the sun is unexhaustible. It's unlimited. Ooh, is it? Why do you say that? Sun, uh, stars are very much limited. Stars have a shelf life. I think that's uh, what science says. Now, granted... It's the or. Huh? The first or. Well, the, there's light. Okay, so there's light. 
light. Makes everything clear. Clarity. Then you get to see what's the real thing. So love about clarity, it's light, warmth. Mm -hmm. Warmth. Maybe. Body. What does everyone think here? So we have so we have idea of light, maybe clarity. clarity. Lama Ba's clarity. Clarity. Truth. Truth. Clarity. clarity. I like that. So I'll see. Clarity. Clarity. Lama Ba's clarity. There's light. What else? Anyone has anything else? Well, what do we know about the sun? Okay, fine. But lots of stars are here the fourth day. Yeah. What's 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 unique about the sun? Let's think of something the that the sun gives, doesn't receive. Yeah, but it I guess the moon also the receives. Week, okay. Sort of. Huh? It makes the week sort of. It well, it makes everything about the week, but it makes it possible here. So you want to say that sun has maybe something to do with Shabbos as well? No. Yeah, so what's significant about that? If the sun stopped uh, stopped shining for seconds, the world would... Uh, yeah, well, we'd all be frosty would, over, frost yeah. over, obviously. Okay, so maybe the sun is vital. We need the sun very much. But we need a lot of things very much, you know? Water. Yeah, and you know, water and the atmosphere and oxygen and carbon and and uh, the food to grow and uh, the wind. Lots of things make our, make life in this this world only possible with, with them. You know, yeah, a lot of things. The heart, our hearts are all pumping. If they all, st- if every one of the world's hearts stop pumping just for five minutes, if the Amari took five minutes off heart pumping, if the if the heart pumping uh, engine that makes all of us heart pump for five minutes just stop for five minutes, we'd all be dead. Yeah, but if it froze to death, we'd all be dead. Well, before, yeah. Before so the, the point is the that pump, the the, pump, the heart pumping would be irrelevant whether it pumps or not. It wanted to pump or not. Okay, well, yeah, so, so, yeah, so is that so unique? Well, well I mean, like lots of sources talk about, you know, light particularly as... Uh, who, who is this? Huh? Who, who, do you, who talks about this? Sorry, like, I, uh, I mean... Uh, sources? In, like, like... Okay, so the sources. Do, um, well, you know, we talked already a little bit about light as, uh, as, uh, as clarity of, like, seeing real, you know, what's really going on, but, like, you know the the description of the the, the light of the first day mm-hmm. as being something that was sort of retracted and brought back for the you know tzaddikim in, in Olam Haba that uh, you know and what we've got is like a, a pale uh, reminder of that. So we need light. What you're doing is you're quoting one of the Talmudic sources that compare Olam Haba to light to to to, to the sun. Right, it says that organus, it's it's yeah. it's 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 it's, uh, it's put away. It's like so that's very good. And you know what I did? I found a whole bunch of other sources that seem to mention the same thing. And I'll uh, I'll uh, present one of them, for example, two of them. Kol hanevi'im lo nitnavu ela limot hamashiach, which I'll translate means all the prophets only prophesized for what's going to be like. In the days of Mashiach, we have wonderful prophecies of the prophets. You guys are going to get this and that and wonderful things of Jewish people and prosperity and health and happiness. All the wonderful things that we find in all the prophets. That's only from the Mashiach. Aval, Olam Haba. But with regards to Olam Haba, Ayin lo ra'ata. What does that mean? Ayin and I can't see it. Even the wonderful prophets that we've had. So it says all the prophets prophesied. Call on Avim. Lo nitnavu eli limot Mashiach. They only foretold for what's going to be like in the days of Mashiach. But in Lama Ba, Ayn Lo Rat. The eye can't see it. Is there anything else that we know that the eye can't see? Light. Well, darkness. You can't look directly at the sun. Booya. Yeah. Booya. The something about the sun is that even though it's hair, it's, it's in a physical world, we can't see it. You, you can't look at it without damaging yourself. Right? There's something about Lama Ba that people couldn't grab the Nevi'im. They can't wrap their heads around. Which is kind of similar to what Maimonides says. Maimonides says that Olam Ba is kind of beyond our scope. You can't describe it. Yet it, 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 it is nothing that we have over here that we could use. There's no v- vernacular. There's no verbiage. There's no words that we could use. We're the, we're the blind person. We can't see it. 
It's interesting that we're blind and can't look at the sun, right? We can't see it. Similarly to the sun. Could you look at the sun? You can't see it, right? So that's uh, one thing that we could say, that, that perhaps that's a similarity. I think there's even a, a deeper level here. We find, again, in the Talmud, the Talmud says is that it be, in the times of Olam Abba, the, the, the light of the sun is going to get diminished. The light of the sun is going to get diminished. And the Talmud is going to get challenged. Wait a minute, why, why would the light get diminished? So the Talmud answers, the reason why the light gets diminished is because compared to the light of the Tzadikim, the, the sun is going to stay the same, the same, the same, the same light. But when compared to the light of the tzaddikim, it's, it's going to seem to be less bright. So not only is 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 this something which is beyond our capacity, but the whole idea of tzaddikim is that tzaddikim bolam ba is that they're going to have this light that's even brighter than the sun. It's a pasuk, isn't it? What's the, that? The, 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 is that the pasuk? The ones that love God are going to be like the sun. No, that the sun would be embarrassed. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's busted, yeah. Now, same. Yeah. so this is the tzaddikim. Now remember, Olam Abba is a time where you don't have a soul. There's no soul. There's, there's no body. Oh, oh there's just a soul. Oh, the, my mind calls it, calls it Olam Neshamot. Perhaps we could say that Olam Abba, because there's nothing um, covering over the, 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 the soul, it's just, it's just soul that are unhindered, unhindered, unmuzzled, Un- uncovered, revealed soul, well, that soul by definition is something which is so super bright, which is you know, even brighter than any, any 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 light source, because that's spirituality. We're told that the that the soul is comp- you know is as pure as God. What does that even mean? Right? Right? So it means that God is pure, the angels are pure, and your soul is pure. The Talmud equates the purity of the soul with the purity of God. Whatever that means, it means that something which is pure spirituality, which is incredible brightness, brighter than anything we could, we could produce. The idea being that an uncovered soul, which is what's going to be Allah Abba, is be so, it's just tremendous brightness. And you could kind of get a similar feeling that if you try to look at the sun. Now, I want to share with y'all a, a wonderful, wonderful idea we know, we're told, the Talmud says in Bob Basra, Pnei Moshe, I don't finish the statement, the face of Moshe, Kepnei Chama, the face of Moshe was like the face of the sun. We're all familiar with the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu wore a mask. Who knows that? Mm-hmm. Jews were able to look at him. Moshe Rabbeinu wore a mask. Why? His face was so bright that Jews couldn't look at him. What does this mean? You know what this means? Moshe Rabbeinu reached such a level that his soul and his well, body, his see. body, exactly, his body was no longer a challenge to his soul or a barrier to his soul. His soul was shining forth. Moshe Rabbeinu was living in this world Amen. as if he was in Olam Abba. His, he was just a soul almost. Well, we know that as well about him. He, he was able to, li- to exist like that, like, just like a soul does, right? That's so significant. You have to wear a mask. The Jews are trying to look at him. I'll tell you even more. We know the Midrash says that our soul and our body are very, very bitter enemies. We think, yeah, we, we, you know, I seem to be kind of calm. I slept eight hours last night. We, we think that we exist without turmoil. But the, Tal- the Mishnah, the Medr- Medrash, not the Talmud, the Medrash says that, uh, the Medrash, by the way, is written from Talmudic era times. So it's, it's, it's as... It's as uh, it has as much uh, legitimacy or veracity or stature or whatever. As it? it well, yeah. Well, it's not quite. It wasn't. In, it wasn't kind of under the Torah, but that's that's the era that we're talking about. It's, it's the it's the it's the Tanaim and the Amoraim who wrote the Medrash. Uh, the Medrash says that every single solitary second that we exist, conflict. our soul wants to leave our body. Our soul wants to leave our body. Every single second. And the Almighty, every second, tells the soul, no, stay in the body, stay in the body, stay in the body, stay in the body. There's, there's such opposites. They're like, the Almighty took, you know, Magnus, two massive Magnus, turned them on the opposite side where they repel each other and took them and just ties them together. And you're going to stay together whether you like it or not. That's, that's what our body and soul, and soul are like. You can't stand each other. That's one thing. And how come is it that 
humans will go to no to any end not to die. Well, that's part of our instinct. Our soul wants out, but the Almighty says, "No, no, no, no. You have you, your body has you, you know you you have to stay in there against your will, and the body is programmed with certain instincts that make it want it to survive. Well, all, all creatures are like that. It's part of the body, part of the way, part of the DNA of us, right? Fast forward to another Medrash, all the way at the end of Medrash Rabba, and it's talking about Moses. Moses is about to die, and." A fascinating exchange. Moses says, No, I'm not dying. Sorry. All the angels say, Moses, we want your soul. So Moses says, No, get out of here. He has the arguments with a soul. He's like, what, he, With the angels, all the angels come and try to get, try to kill Moses. And he just destroys them all. And then the Almighty says, I'm going to take care of this myself. And the Almighty says to the soul, Come, come out. What does is, what is, what is Moses' soul say? There is no better place for me in the world to be than with Hashem. Then in Moses' body. Moses was on such a level, Moshe had been on such a level, that his body was even better than Lama Ba. His soul and his body were in total unison, total harmony. His body was at the same level, even higher than Lama Ba. Right? His soul felt totally at home. And you know what it looked like to us? What did it look like to the Jewish people? Like looking at the sun. Pnei Moshe ka Pnei Chama. Moshe was living in this world in Lama Ba. If when we look at the sun, right, we can try to look at the sun for a little bit. Not when it's setting now. Look at it when it's Kitseis Hashemish Bigvurato, like the sun when it's in its full power. Try looking at it. You get a little bit of a glimpse of what it's like for Tzadikim, unhindered souls, Olam Abba. A little bit like one with Moses. A little tiny bit. It's, ain't. it's similar. Why? Because the, it's much brighter. And in fact, the actual sun is going to be diminished compared to the, to the brightness of Tzadikim. That's the second thing. Let's get to the last one. What's the last thing that we're told about the Olam Abba? Tashmish. Tashmish is a noun, correct? The Talmud has a debate what this means. Does it mean sexual intercourse or does it mean removing one's bowels? The Talmud should have just told us three things are with Olam Abba. Shabbos, Shemesh, Tashmish, Nekavim. Tell us which one it is. Why does the Talmud have to engage in this debate? Why does the Talmud have to say, Oh, it's Tashmish. I'll just leave it ambiguous. And then they'll see, Okay, Tashmish, which Tashmish? Is it this Tashmish? Or is it that Tashmish? It seems like if it's just, Why, why, why is it playing games with us? Why just say it straight out? Right? Olam Abba is uh, similar to three things. Tashmish, Nekavim. Don't, uh, you know, why is it leaving it ambiguous? So in a point that uh, I think Rudy was touching on, when the, when the Talmud says, uh, Tashmish Demai, which Tashmish are we talking about? Is it Tashmish Amita? No, that makes you weak. Rather, it's Tashmish Nekavim, going to the bathroom. I think the lesson here is like this. Even if, even if we could say that the, that the pleasure of sexual intercourse is greater than the ple- pleasure of removing one's bowels. It's possible. It's greater. Right. Still, what the Talmud is trying to tell us here is not that the pleasure in Lama Ba is going to be a lot of pleasure, wonderful pleasure. In fact, we're told, Yafesh Achat Ba'olama Ba Mikol Olam One second of pleasure in Lama Ba is greater than all the pleasure in this world. So obviously, we're not, we're not comparing the magnitude of the pleasure of, uh, of the pleasure of, of of one of these two things to the pleasure of Lama Ba. Why? It's not, it's not what we're comparing. What we're comparing is the kind of pleasure. The, uh, the not the quantity, perhaps the quality. And we're saying Tashmish. Tashmish Demai. Which Tashmish are we talking about? If it means Tashmish Nekavim, uh, uh, Tashmish Amita, that makes you weak. What does that mean? What does it mean it makes you weak? Rudy, you tell me, what does it mean? Pleasures that we have, physical pleasures, are different than spiritual pleasures. How so? When you have a physical pleasure, almost always there ha- there's a there's a where's you at? Or there is a there's a price to pay. There's a bad aftertaste. There's a letdown, right? The pleasure 
always has or almost always has something bitter that goes along with it. However bitter small. Bitter aftertaste. Bitter aftertaste, exactly. And even if, even if the pleasure does not have a bitter aftertaste, it doesn't last. So you can have an ice cream. Ice cream, delicious. Wonderful, right? And then after the ice cream is finished, you may have a stomachache. Bitter aftertaste. But even if you don't have a bitter aftertaste, you still don't have a pleasure. Pleasure is gone. Correct? Well, that, that, that maybe is a consequence that you want more. But everything, that we, all pleasures in this world, when you have them, you have them. And when you don't have them, they're gone. Whatever the cause for the pleasure is, when it ceases, well, then it's over. Oftentimes, when it ceases, you feel bad. There's a letdown. There's a bitter aftertaste. That's the nature of this kind of pleasure. Well, I'm about, we're told, it's a pleasure that is eternal, which means it's not time-capped. It doesn't have a, there's no end point. This is something hard for us to imagine. How could you have a pleasure that doesn't have an end point, right? When the pleasure's there, then it's there. When it's not, it's not. Right? When the cause for the pleasure is there, then the pleasure's there. When the cause ceases, then it usually there's a letdown, but uh, certainly the pleasure ends. Well, but it's not like that. Not only is there no letdown, there's no negative thing, but that does never cease. What's the one pleasure, the olam azeh, that is in some way similar to it? It can't be tashmish hamita, because then you feel bad afterwards. There's, you get weak afterwards. Any pleasure, well, that, that's a very, it's an example of a physical pleasure. It's a lamazet kind of pleasure. There's one pleasure that you don't feel worse after it. You don't feel worse after it, and you kind of feel good um, from that uh, going forward. Like you mentioned, if someone needs, really needs to go to the bathroom, well, they go to the bathroom, and yes, yeah, someone could argue that going to the bathroom is pleasuresome. But you, that also goes on a little bit further. You feel good afterwards, right? You feel like, oh gosh, I cleared myself out. I feel much better. I feel healthier now. I feel, I feel better. Yeah. It's the one example that is in some way, in some minor way, similar to the kinds of pleasures that want to have a Lama Ba. A Lama Ba is a pleasure that just keeps on going. The diff that keeps on giving. In Olam Azeh, we can look high and low. We can't really find a pleasure that's, that, that's the same way. There is one thing that has shears on a small micro level a characteristic with, with uh, Olam Azeh pleasures. And that's the pleasure. Just, just, that's the only thing we can find is going to the bathroom. Why is that? Because the pleasure keeps on going. Not only do you not feel bad afterwards, but the pleasure keeps on going. Why don't they mention learning Torah? pleasure of having children and grandchildren and seeing their nachat from them. Okay, that's a good question. What about learning Torah? That's a good question. What about learning Torah? It's hard a lot of times in this. Well, so what if it's hard? It's rewarding. What about learning Torah? What about studying Torah? It's a good question. You know what the answer is, Rudy? I'm telling you? The answer is... <clears throat> drum roll, please. Olam Abba is something that we can actually experience in this world. When someone studies Torah, and I'll get to how it works, when someone studies Torah, the pleasure someone gets from studying Torah is not Olam Azeb pleasure, this world pleasure. It's actually world-to-come pleasure. There's the more reason why it should have been mentioned. No! That's the whole yeah. point. It's not me, ain't no. Lama Ba. It's Lama Ba itself. It's Lama Ba itself. And I'll prove you it were to saying you. that if you're trying, and, and I agree with you, obviously, there's no way to argue, O Lama Ba is so foreign to us that we cannot describe it. How could you describe color to a blind person or sound to a deaf person? Why not? So Why can't you describe color? Because there is no tool or no, no mode Why of not? expression. Because you haven't experienced Because that, that person that has no because notion the, what because you light expe- blue or... Uh, because the blind person never experienced color. E- exactly. So, so, so if, to explain if, if Olam Abba... Let human me finish. To explain Olam Abba, Rudy, to someone who never was never there, 
You can't do it. But if you're saying that studying Torah is like Ulam Haba, okay, so you could easily tell them, hey, you know what uh, Ulam Haba is Easily, like? easily. Study Torah, just like when we study Torah, the joy of learning. No, 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 like no, 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 no. Okay, so, so let me explain to you. Not every time you study Torah can you get this pleasure. And I'll bring you Maimonides. We're told a very, very famous, listen to this, this is someone you listen to it, I'm talking to you. There's a very famous mitzvah in the Torah to love God. Anyone familiar with the verse? What does that mean? Translate. You should love Hashem your God with all your hearts, with all your with all your your soul, and your might or your resources, your money, whatever. How do you love God? What do you do? How do you how do you how do you first of all how do you command to have a certain emotion? What do you? What does that even mean? I ha- how do I go about doing this? Tzitzis, I know. You get by tzitzis, tefillin, I know. Every mitzvah, I know. It's something that you do. You do it. Study Torah, I know. I'll stop. Take a book and I'll start studying. Well, first, uh, by listening. Thinking, first of all. Same thing. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe. Maybe yeah, that's. Then you grow all the things it gave you, the light. Okay, so you're saying, so you're saying, you're that, saying Shema in the morning. So you're saying that the way to do it. You're giving me a process. You're answering my question. You're saying, this is a process. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start having gratitude and appreciation. We'll have gratitude to the Almighty, and then we'll have appreciation, and then we'll love Him. That's a very, very wonderful process, and I fully encourage it. The Sifri, the Sifri is also Talmudic era. In fact, it's even early. It's a Mishnaic era. It's a commentary on the uh, books of the Torah. It's like the Medrash. Like the Mechilta, like the Torah's Konim, like the Sifra. These are names of books written by Tanoim on the uh, on the Chazals of of the of the uh, of the of the of the of the of the my way of like of the Torah. And it says on this pasuk something very interesting. It doesn't say what you said. It says something different. What does it say? You have to love Hashem. How much you have to love Hashem? With all your, all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your resources. You've got to love Hashem a lot. How do you do that? By studying Torah. Let me finish. Okay. You love God by studying Torah. Let's open up the Maimonides. Maimonides in Mitzvah Gimel. Maimonides wrote many, many, many books. We're familiar. Someone mentioned Yad HaChazaka, otherwise called Mishnah Torah. We meant we 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 quoted uh, earlier from the Pirush Hamishnais from the commentary of the Mishnah. We're all familiar with the More Nevuchim, the Guide to the Perplexed. But there's another book that he wrote, which is called the Sefer Hamitzvos, the Book of Mitzvos. In it, he delineates. All 613 mitzvot, he counts them. What? Mitzvot number one is to believe in God. As it says in the verse, and he gives a little snapshot of the mitzvah. Mitzvah two, mitzvah, mitzvah three, the third mitzvah is to love God. And when he says, what he uh, outlines is a way to experience the pleasure of Allah Mahabha in this world. And I'll, tell, I'll say word for what he says. Mitzvah gimel, mitzvah shlishit. La'ahavo, to love God. Shene'emar, as it says in the verse, Ve'ahavta et Hashem alokecha, b'chol v'chol 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 How do you love God? Yachshov, to think. V'yitbonen, and to contemplate. B'ma'amarav, in God's Torah. B'mitzvotav, in God's mitzvah. B'pe'ulotav, in God's creation. Add, you have to think and analyze the Torah, add, until sheyasigeyu, until you have an insight, until you have a hasaga, accomplishment. Ve'yehene, or ve'yitane, different uh, words, right? And you should take pleasure. Be'hasagato, in this insight. Be'tachlit ha'hana'a, in the highest level of pleasure. Ze'u ha'ava mechoyevas, this is the mitzvah of loving God. To love God means to have an insight, to think, to analyze, until you have a wonderful insight, and that insight is going to give you the highest levels of pleasure. 
That's what it means to love God. What Maimani has described to us is that it's possible for someone to study Torah in this world, in Houston, Texas, 2014, and to have tachlit hata'anut, the highest level of pleasure. Now, how do I know he's talking about Olam Abba? Because if you look at Maimonides elsewhere, he says, Olam Abba is tachlit hata'anut. Same thing, same words. Same words used to describe it. It is possible. Now, like you said, it doesn't mean, let's study Torah. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah? That's not what he's referring to, studying Torah. He's referring to a certain kind of studying Torah. Thinking. Number one. Lehit bornen. To analyze, to contemplate, to think as deep as possible until you have an insight. Until you strike gold. And that will give you a, a pleasure, which is the pleasure of Lama Ba. So in a sense... Okay, and I'll, I'll prove this to you again uh, from somewhere else. In a sense, what, what, the answer to your question, why does the Talmud not just say, uh, to say, three things about Ein Olam Abba? Study in Torah. You know why? It's not Me'ein Olam Abba at all. It's not Me'ein, it's not similar to Olam Abba. It's not similar at all. It's the same thing. You can have the same thing. It's possible to, on this world to have the same thing. Absolutely. And that's not an example of a physical thing which is similar. Similar means it's similar in some ways, but dissimilar in other ways. Studying Torah is similar because it's in every way because it's actually the same thing. Now, I told you I'll prove it to you from another source, and that is the source, not by the Ramchal, the author of this uh, wonderful work, Jewish philosophy, but he also wrote a book called Misilati Sharim. You ever heard of Misilati Sharim? Yes. The Way of the Upright, the Path of the Just. And in the beginning, he starts off by saying, what's the purpose of man in this world? You know what the purpose is? To have the greatest level of pleasure. Right? And where is this level, of, where is this place of pleasure? Where is it? It's an olam abba, Right? But what do you do to get the pleasure? You do the mitzvot. Olam azeh. You do the mitzvot in this world and get the pleasure in the next world. That's, what he's, that's how he starts off his book. If anyone has, has read the beginning introduction, he basically outlines Jewish philosophy. We're here to get pleasure. Where do we get the pleasure? Olam Abba. How do we get the pleasure by doing the mitzvot? Where do we do, where do, we do the mitzvot in this world? And there he invokes the Talmud that you mentioned, that you, if you work on Erev Shabbos, you get reward on Shabbos. Right? If you work on Olam Azeh, you get reward on Olam Abba. If you analyze very, very, very critically the words of Ramchal, of Lutzato, in the beginning of Islat Tishrem, you see that he says it in black and white, that in this world as well, we can tap into the pleasure of, yeah. of Olam Abba. And I'll, I'll read it again in Hebrew, and I'll try it. Sorry, I, don't, I, I wish I had, I wish I'd written sources so you guys could see it inside. I'll try, read it and translate it. What does he say? Ha'adam lo nivra ela lehitaneg al Hashem. Man was only created for one purpose, to have the pleasure of God. Shezehu ha'ta'anud ha'amiti. This is the ta'anud. What does ta'anud mean? Pleasure. Pleasure. Hamiti. The real pleasure. Veha'idun hagadol minkolo idunim. And the greatest idun. What does idun mean? Idun. Gan eden. Also, it's another term for pleasure. Olam haba is so wonderful. It's such pleasure. It's the, it's the true pleasure and it's the greatest pleasure. That's what he says, Right? And he gives two, two words to describe the pleasure. Ta'anud and idun. And then the very next sentence, he says, V'hine, makom ha'idun hazeh, the place of this idun, hu olam haba. It's olam haba. But wait a minute, didn't you just tell me that there's two kinds of pleasures? There's ta'anud and idun. And as we know, whenever you read Lusat, you have to read it very, very, very critically. So my grandfather, in his book called Alei Shur, chap, uh, volume 2, he says, what Ramchal is telling you is the same thing Maimonides is telling you. That yes, Makom HaIdun, the place of Idun is Olam Abba. Makom HaTa'anuk? Olam Azeh. Olam Azeh. It's possible for us to do that. How? With the, with the process of Maimonides. So I believe that's the answer to your question. Now, um, I actually know people that have actually done this and have actually experienced it and swear by it. But, you know, the rest of us, we're the blind people. They could say, it's awesome! I want to describe it to you. But we're blind. You can't describe it to us, right? Well, unless you've experienced it, you're the blind person trying to understand what color looks like. You can't. 
you have to experience it. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. People that have done it, right? And live to tell the tale, right? So to conclude, what time is it? It's uh, eight oh three. It's perfect timing. To conclude, you guys, all, you guys also came seven minutes later. Okay, don't look at me. <laughs> uh, we have here a short piece of Talmud, and I think it's very illuminating because it does shed light on Olam Abba. Olam Abba is really at the center of our philosophy. If you look at my mind, once again, Ramchal, the first thing he writes about, the reason why we're here is to have Olam Abba. What's Olam Abba? It's a wonderful place of pleasure. This Talmud is saying that, yes, while we can't really experience it in a physical world, right, with the exception of Torah, which we can, but that's, once again, not a physical world. We could tap into the Olam Abba. There are physical things. There's, there's times where we can actually uh, have a me'ain, have something which is similar, which is a little bit like certain aspects of Olam Abba. Shabbos, we mentioned. Shabbos is a time where we stop doing, right? We consume. Olam Abba is a time of consumption. That's one th- explanation we said. But if you're a soul, you're not consuming anything. You're just enjoying. What do you mean? Ne- you're what? Consuming. Enjoy you're consuming whatever. By definition, you're not... Spiritual well, you, being you're, doesn't you're, consume phys- well, phys- physical you're not You're not consuming something which is disappearing. It's not, you're not depleting, if that's what you mean. Exactly. But you are, you, it's exactly what you're doing, Lama Ba. What you're doing is you're consuming the spiritual realities, the spiritual bread that you create in this world with your mitzvahs. It's indeed what you're doing. So that's one explanation we gave. A deeper explanation we gave is that Lama Ba is a time where our nishamot are, are in the driver's seat and our bodies in the back on the trunk, kicking, right? And therefore, in Lama Ba, we feel very, very naturally doing mitzvot. And on Shabbat, we also feel that because Shabbat is a mitzvah where our bodies are very much involved as well. It's eating, it's sleeping, it's tanut, it's delicious stuff. That's the mitzvah. And that mitzvah is a time where we're supposed to feel like, in Lama Ba, it's to be like this. Mitzvahs are going to be, the mitzvahs that for us are so difficult to do, Allah has to be a pleasure to do it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a delight. Just like Shabbat. So Shabbat is a time where you can experience what it's going to be in this kind of world. That's the first thing. Shemesh, we said. Shemesh, we mentioned the first idea of Shemesh is clarity. So Allah is time more clarity. We're not going to have this mishmash of the body and the soul and intelligence and this and that. What are we supposed to do? Right? Lack of clarity is one of the chief uh, components of this world. We know the world is called, what's the Hebrew word for world? Olam. Olam. And famously, we know that the word He'elem, which means. Hidden. Hidden or concealed, right? right? It's, something, it's mysterious. This world's a mysterious world. We won't have an Alam So that's one idea. Another idea we said is that a much deeper idea of Moshe's face was like the sun. Alam is a time where souls are unleashed. And when souls are unleashed, we see something that's as pure as God. It's so bright, it makes the sun seem very, very, very minor in its illumination in comparison. And lastly, we said... It's compared uh, to removing one's bowels. Why is that? That's the one example of a time where someone does something and has a certain measure of pleasure, and then the pleasure doesn't end. It continues, and there's no letdown. It's not negative afterwards. Lama Ba is a time for eternal pleasure. And lastly, we mentioned is that is it possible for us to somehow experience this now? Do we have to wait till we're dead and the Tchata Metim will do? No, we don't have to. But is it easy? It's not easy at all. And there's a process, and the process was outlined in Maimonides, and there are people today that will swear that this is absolutely true. You're able to tap into this certain level of pleasure via Torah that is unmatched by anything that you could possibly, unreplicated by anything anything physical. So, and, I, and obviously we're greatly encouraged to do that, and that's one of the very most important misses of the Torah, is to love God. Maimonides says there's only one, one way to do it. Get that pleasure. Get Alam Abba. Well, that's it. Go out and get it. And uh, thank you all for uh, participating. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The first time, I think it was, uh, you know, that his students saw his study in Torah on uh, Tisha B'Av. I said, Rabbi, don't you know that you're not allowed to study Torah? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He says, yeah, I know that I could be punished severely, but the joy of learning Torah, is so I can't live one day without it.